Hi everybody, this is Noelle from Petiti Garden Centers and we're here at Oakwood Village in our favorite runway, which is Stella's runway. So come and visit Stella sometime. We're gonna do a spotlight on Rudbeckia or also known as Black Eyed Susans. Um, it's a great plant, awesome plant. It's part of the Aster family, believe it or not. There are close to two dozen species of Black Eyed Susans or Rudbeckia out there. So you'll see them everywhere. And at this time of year, kind of late summer, you do see them out and about. And it's because everybody is very, very successful with them. They are a native of the Midwest, United States. Um, so it's a great plan to have. Let's talk about success points here and how to grow them well. Like I said, it's pretty easy. They're pretty easy, low maintenance perennials. So first of all, sun. They really prefer full sun conditions so that six or more hours of sunlight. If you have an area that has light shade, maybe partial shade, so that four to six hours, they'll still grow, they'll still work. They might get a little stretchy, so you might get these longer stems. You might not get as many buds and blooms. Believe me, they'll still do fine, okay? Soil-wise, average soil, okay? So average soil, we always talk about amending your soil, making sure that it's draining out, adding those organic matters to the soil. So your sweet peats, your compost, your uh, peat mosses, what have you, manures, all of those things help. Make sure that that soil is not heavy clay, although it can tolerate it, and um, they'll be fine. I think when you think about black-eyed Susans, think about a meadow or a prairie type condition or environment, and you'll be really successful with them. So that's usually a little bit fluffier, well-drained soils maybe even slightly dry. They can take some moisture, but really it's better to keep them on the drier side. I just had a monarch fly over my head, that was awesome. Um, after that, watering wise, average watering, so it's always one inch of water, one time per week through the growing season, especially their first year when you're trying to get them established, because we want the root system to move down into the soil and not stay up at the top of the soil. So that's why those long, deep waterings one time per week are really great for them. And especially with Black Eyed Susans, they can get some powdery mildew and some disease issues on their foliage. So you wanna make sure when you're watering, it's really best to water them at the base of the plant. Try to avoid overhead watering them because of course all those water droplets can um, exacerbate any type of disease issue that might occur. So keep that in mind. Another thing is when you're planting them, space them out and give them some good air circulation. That will reduce any type of disease issue they have. We talk about that with roses. We talk about that with uh, Black Eyed Susan's lilacs, things that commonly get powdery mildew or other foliar diseases. It's good to give them some space and have that air move around them. So keep that in mind when you're planting. I think for fertilizer, same as most perennials. So you can apply plant tone and iron tone in the spring when they start to emerge. You can apply it one more time midsummer, and that'll take them through the season. Believe me, they're pretty abuse tolerant, so and they adapt, again, because of their native abilities. So a lot of fertilizer is really not helpful at this point. And just remember, if you're applying a high nitrogen fertilizer, you won't see as many blooms. So watch out for that first number in your fertilizer ratio, because if you put more nitrogen down, less blooms, more foliage, okay? So try to keep it either a balanced fertilizer where the numbers are all the same in the fertilizer ratio, or maybe where it has a little bit of a higher number, okay? Um, in the middle, I should say, middle and end number. Um, okay, let's talk about attributes. And I think with Black Eyed Susans, again, so beautiful, beautiful long stems, beautiful flowers, so they're great for cutting. Cut them. The reason being is the more you cut, the more they'll produce more branching growth and more buds and blooms. So make sure you're using them. You can cut them, you can dry them. They make excellent dried flowers. So that's something to really keep in mind because 
the maintenance on Black Eyed Susans, again, there's a lot of deadheading to it, but you can literally, they'll produce stems, you know, dozens of stems at a time. You can take a handful of stems and literally cut down at the base of the stems. You have a whole bouquet and that whole part of that plant will flush out again and continue to bloom. So they are long bloomers, excellent bloomers, usually starting late June, carrying you with color throughout October. So again, long bloomers are excellent for that. Deer resistant. So most of them are deer resistant. The reason being is there's a lot of fuzz and hairiness on their foliage. Yes, I have seen deer come by and nip off the petals every once in a while. It's not a typical thing and they're so profuse blooming that typically you don't have a lot of problems, a lot of damage with deer. So uh, keep that in mind. It's nice to have in the garden. Winter interest. So these flowers, as they move into October, they'll, they'll fade, they'll dry on the stems. You can keep them up all winter long, actually have a dried flower to look at, and then you can go ahead and cut back early spring when new growth is showing at the base. So that's something you know really nice for them for that fall and winter interest as well in the, in the perennial garden or in a landscape border. They look phenomenal for that too. They are a companion to a lot of different plants. So you can tell through this uh, display that Stella set up, we have grasses here. This is little bunny grass. It's a nice short grass, but they look gorgeous with a background of taller grasses behind them too. Perennial hibiscus, the taller hibiscus, they look gorgeous planted in front of those as well. Plant them with a lot of purples and blues, like the asters in front. We have honey song purple, which is a beautiful big flowering uh, perennial aster. But your, your regular asters, your English asters, no problem. They grow very, very well with them. And again, awesome pollinator attractants with the aster family. So black-eyed Susans, asters, you, you'll bring in the pollinators, no problem whatsoever. I should mention that black-eyed Susans are a larval host for, I'm trying to think of two butterflies. There are two butterflies on that list. I'll have Taylor uh, list them. I just can't think of the names right now, but they do um, a, are a larval host for two particular butterflies. So we'll list that for you as well. But pollinators, there's plenty of honeybees buzzing around here today. Um, like I said, had the monarch fly over my head. Haven't seen too many butterflies resting here just yet, but it's a little bit windy today. So we're not going to get a lot of, of butterfly resting on top of the flowers just now. Um, let's talk about varieties. I think we kind of hit all the attributes, but again, just fabulous plant. And I think it's a plant, again, that it develops so well through the perennial garden that you can end up giving it and dividing it and giving it to friends and family and what have you. Now, these plants can grow fairly vigorously. So that's part of the reason why people are very successful with them, but they do grow well in large swaths, large groupings. So keep that in mind. They just look so attractive in that type of planting. And I did want to add um, with the division, again, most of these can be divided because they're midsummer to late bloomers. You can divide them in the spring when they first start to emerge or you can cut them back a little bit later and go ahead and divide them in the fall. So it really doesn't, it doesn't matter spring or fall with the Black Eyed Susan for division, no problem whatsoever, okay? Um, two different families that we tend to focus our growing on. One of them is called Rubecchia herta, okay? And these are the types of Rubecchia that are really large flowering. So you have one here. This one's called Indian Summer. Indian Summer is about a three to three and a half foot plant in the garden. Um, you have one here. This one's called Prairie Sun. We love Prairie Sun because of those green eyes. It's like a green eyed Susan. Um, but again, in that family has two different colors, like a bicolor petal here, deeper yellow and then lighter yellow and that green eye. So those are spectacular. 
about two and a half feet there, maybe up to three. And then also there's this new one. This is called a mini Beckia because they are much more compact in habit. This particular variety is called mini Beckia flame. It does have a darker eye, a nice raised uh, dark um, center, and then um, the central disc flower in the center. So these herta varieties, herta means hairy. So when you feel the foliage on these plants, super fuzzy stems are super fuzzy, almost coarse in the fuzz. Therefore, you get less browsing from deer, okay? And, and also bunnies too. Um, so that's a good thing. I need to tell you with these herd of varieties, they're very, very ornamental. And in that respect, they are sometimes an annual for us, sometimes a biennial for us in Northeast Ohio, sometimes a tender or short-lived perennial. So it kind of depends. The trick here with these varieties is that you want to be able to save the cone because it's developing seeds for next year, okay? So when you do cut these and deadhead them and use them in flower arrangements, always let that cone dry so you can harvest those seeds and then go ahead and reseed them. And you can do that in the fall when those cones are dry. It usually takes like, I would say a month after they're done flowering, that seed cone should be ready to harvest. You can go ahead and sow the Rebecca right around where they're standing, if you like that spot where you planted it. And then they actually will develop very small leaves in the fall. And then next season, you should see some flowering developing from that plant. And that's that kind of biennial cycle, if you will. Um, like I said, sometimes you can protect them with some mulching over the winter. So apply a winter mulch, usually in mid, late November, a few inches around the Rudbeckia. That can help, of course, protect them as well. So just a couple of tricks to keep those in mind. And I should say you can sow those seeds indoors in spring. Usually mid-February, you can start sowing them and you'll be able to plant some of the Rudbeckia herda outside come probably late April, early May, as long as you kind of acclimate those seedlings to the temperatures outdoors. Now, the other variety that we tend to grow, or I should say other species that we tend to grow, and what you see in a lot of landscapes is Rudbeckia fulgida. And Rudbeckia fulgida is the smaller flowering variety in front here, but it is definitely the most common and it is definitely hardy out there, meaning true perennial will come back in the garden in three years or more, and usually will continue coming and producing and producing more for you every year. The most common variety that we see is Goldsturm, and Goldsturm is throughout this display here. It is a phenomenal blooming plant, typically grows to about 24, 30 inches tall has thicker basal foliage, and, and Taylor and I will show you that. Um, this plant has been perennial plant of the year. Um, golly, it was 1999 when it got named, you know, that plant um, or awarded that distinction. So they've, it's been around, it is fabulous. I will say the one problem with it is it is a fairly aggressive grower. Again, it's not an invasive plant. It is a true native variety. Um, but it will grow very full, very quickly. Um, so keep that in mind. The other thing about Goldsturm is that it does get what we call Rudbeckia leaf spot. It's septoria leaf spot. So it'll get these kind of brownish burgundy spots on the foliage. It's just, that is a disease that is very common with Rudbeckia. So when you see those brown or burgundy spots on Rudbeckia, it's that plant, and again, making sure that you water at the base and making sure it gets good air circulation helps reduce that occurrence. Another one that I have here is Viet's Little Susie. Different variety, but a little bit more compact. Usually grows about 18 inches in the garden. A little bit stretchy. We've talked about with perennials, when they grow in pots, sometimes they stretch up taller than what they normally grow. Um, so Viet's Little Susie is a compact, 
the foliage is very narrow on it, so it gives you a little bit of different leaf texture. Still a great bloomer and has some good disease resistance to it. And then the newest one is an award winner. It's an All-American Selections winner, and it's actually uh, developed in 2020. And this one is called American Gold Rush, and it looks very similar to Viet's Little Susie. Um, and it, it's fairly compact growing, like 24 inches by 24 inches. But that one has the best disease resistance on its foliage out of all of them. So something to consider when you're you know, looking at your Black Eyed Susans, trying to figure out what heights, shapes, you know, flower sizes that you like out there, but really all of them are wonderful to enjoy in that full sun and will really give you that long lasting color out in the garden. So enjoy.